Okay, so welcome to our Collaboration as a Force for Change webinar. Um, we first started thinking about this topic because there has been so much upheaval over the past year. Um, we've seen companies working in ways that we've um, that they probably wouldn't have even thought about a year ago and probably in ways that hadn't been available to them as well. Um, we've seen companies switching between B2B to B2C. We've seen e-commerce become major operations overnight and we've seen stock um, moving from very specific channels to a shift of let's just get this stock into our um, customers' hands somehow um, because of all of the, um, the, the ch um, channel challenges we've had this year. And all of that takes a huge amount of cooperation and co collaboration as well. And I think in many ways it's broken down barriers for um, how we work across the supply chain. So I thought now we've got Brexit, um, hopefully Brexit and stock starting to move from the beginning of the year. And we've got COVID um, restrictions hopefully easing now. So now is actually a really good time to sort of take stock, look at what's been done over the past year. And how can we maybe refine that and take some of that forward um, to circumvent some of the challenges that we've got coming up. And I suspect that Brexit um, or COVID, sorry, has been masking some of the impacts of COVID as well, um, particularly at the beginning of the year. Um, so I'm going to ease in our panellists. I'm going to be nice and um, ask if anybody, everybody wouldn't mind just saying hi, say who you are, um, and then just very briefly um, what your model is, if that's okay. So I'm gonna gonna go clockwise. Eric, would you um would you mind kicking us off? Yes, hi, um, I'm Eric Lahn. I'm the MD of the Vine King. We are retail based in Surrey. We've got four shops, one wine bar, and one of the shops is a hybrid model as well. And uh, we've been going since what, 2005. Um, and it's weird. It's, every year it seems to have tried not to go bust, and we're still here. So that's good news. <laughs> Um, who's next? Shall we go? Keep going um, clockwise. So Ben, do you want to do you want to kick off? Hi there, I'm Ben. Uh, so I'm one of the lead consultants at T-Vision Technology and we sell an ERP solution for the drinks industry called Bevica. Um, so I've been at uh, T-Vision for approximately four years now, but before that I worked at a couple of the large wholesalers um, in an operations role. So I've, I have worked on the wine trade side as well. It's not all just systems and data with me. Great. Um, John, you're up. Um, hi, I'm John. Uh, we founded a, a, an agency business in 2016, a month before Brexit, um, and quickly decided that we had to change our model and as such developed a um, joint venture with a food manufacturer called Carnivali. So we are now a, um, an importer. We supply regional wholesalers. Um, we also have our own wholesale operation in London. And then we supply some select um, national wholesalers and retailers, as well as lovely specialists such as Eric. Um, so uh, yeah, um, we are we have our fingers in many different channels, and we try to do what's best in each of those channels, um, respecting the different stakeholders within. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Jamie. Thanks, so, yeah. So I'm Jamie Windriffis, and I founded a company called Propeller right in the middle of lockdown last year, which allows boutique producers to get access to the UK to straight into independent retail without going through the normal <clears throat> um, hand-wringing process of finding an agent. So we, we kind of uh, act as an incubator for wineries that want to make a start in the UK and we support them with marketing, market research, sales, logistics, billing, etc. Uh, with a view to them subsequently being taken on by a bigger more mainstream distributor once once we've established their volume. Great, thanks everyone. And and for everybody who's um, joined us um, sort of the last minute or so, we're going to be talking about collaboration and how different parts of the supply supply chain are working closer together. Maybe a little bit more understanding and goodwill that could be taken forward um, over the coming months. Um, and we will talk about what collab more collaboration we'd like to see. Um, for the benefit of the trade but I think for now it might be interesting just to talk about what you've been doing differently this year how have you had to work differently and what perhaps barriers has that 
enabled you to um, break down in terms of how you deal with different parts of the supply chain um, and, and, and how collaboration does play a part in that. Um, Eric, do you want to do you want to kick us off again? Yeah, delighted. So for us, I mean, we were prior to um, Brexit and COVID, we, were, we were importing quite a lot of stuff ourselves direct, but also dealing with agencies here in the UK. Uh, for me, a large part of my buying also comes through with independence, which I'm a, uh, one of the shareholders of, and that worked uh, really well. But I, mean, I think particularly this last year has been um, a big change. Fortunately, most of my business is retail orientated, and so we're a business consumer. Uh, wholesale business obviously got shelved, um, and there's only generally a few people now actually placing a few orders. A lot of people have got a major issue about trying to actually make that work and make money out of it um, due to literally how many bums and things you can get. Uh, the equations just don't really stack up, so a lot of them are very nervous about stock. Um, so anyway, so we, we started doing new things. Um, we did uh, some diving straight into events online, and a huge amount of business uh, with that, uh, doing Zoom tasting. Uh, let's face it, I think booze is the only thing that makes these meetings more bearable. And, um, and, and a lot of people have been, been enjoying those. And I think the amazing thing about this is that you know, we did one tasting which literally spanned Dubai all the way through to San Francisco all at one time. I and mean, whenever you get reach like that, and I'm not quite sure how, how sober the guys in Dubai were compared to the guys in San Francisco at two in the morning. Eric, sorry, I think we've um, I've lost audio with you here. Can you um, can you hear me? Can't can't hear you, Eric. Can anybody else hear Eric? Mm, no. No, sorry, Eric. I think you dropped out there. You were mid flow. Sorry. Wait. We, 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 heard, we heard we heard you up until Dubai. Eric. You were talking about okay. The, uh, <laughs> about Dubai. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what happened. I'm I'm, I'm out in the midst of uh, the wilds of Wales at the moment, so um, maybe, maybe the, the wind blew the wrong way or something. But no. So so um, can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So you know. So um, I, I think for me, there's there's you know embracing technology that we're forced to, such as Zoom technology. Zoom technology is actually really good and we're doing quite a few more virtual events and it means we can hook up with like um, you know wine producers all the way over from uh, New Zealand and doing all the dog points next week mm -hmm. so he'll be in New Zealand we'll all my customers will be here in the UK um, obviously it means that you have to send up a lot of stuff by couriers uh, which I'm sure all of us have enjoyed a huge amount over the last uh, year or so um, but I would say they are getting better um, as long as it's in the UK uh, we've had a few, well, we've had every single time we've tried to send something into Europe. Um, the courier system's just fallen over. It's been a disaster. Mm. And I don't think they know what they're doing. And I don't think there's been any guidance. And each country does their own thing. And I've got stuff in warehouses in Holland and Germany and France that I don't know where it's going to reappear to. But mm. so the virtual taste, I think, is great. I think there's a huge amount. I think I'm quite pleased that we're not really concentrating on wholesale because I think it's been an absolute. You know, shocker for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, I've got some dear friends of mine who've got wine bars in the centre of London. Mm -hmm. So you do think that these guys are absolutely being hit left, right, centre. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's really, yeah, very, very tough. But yeah. I think the positive is that we can all, you know, we've done a lot of times having conversations with people, how we can help work with others in different levels of the business. So we've done a bit of work with John and bought some various wines. But I think it's always important having that conversation like, look, what have you got? What do you want to sell? What, how can we help? And then I think all of us have got a team together. Uh, I think especially still with another year of service going on, it's really important that it's collaborative. Mm. Uh, mm. And in terms of supplier, because you were saying to me um, earlier about working with smaller suppliers and perhaps um, working with a, with a broader spectrum than you would have done previously. Do you think there's a sort of a, a greater understanding around flexibility to be able to do that going forward? I, I think so. And I think, I mean, for example, like, you know, a good friend of mine, he supplied a lot of uh, restaurants up in London. So we, we, he said, well, look, I'm nothing for a year. I've got these stocks, what can you do? Going forward, some people representing you know, smaller, more niche agencies are, are 
more the conversation they want to have. The other thing which has been very interesting, how it was put the, the absolute magnifying, um, magnifying glass onto online um, business. And then the problems with that are also the way you can be easily compared on price. And so there are also some people who are literally operating online, making 10 to 15% margin. Uh, they won't only, uh, probably only stop, but they'll order it in from some of the bigger guys. And the issue therefore we have is that you know, certain big lines such as maybe Grey Rocky Sauvignon Blanc, for example, that you'll find somewhere always cheaper than you. Whispering Angel, I mean, spare me, but um, it's everywhere and it's dirt, 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 dirt cheap. And you're kind of thinking, well, people are using it almost like Cardi Bay used to many years ago. So it goes back to this unique product is really, really critical. Mm -hmm. And also dealing with people who understand the supply chain and where the wines are going to go and where they're going to appear. Um, because if they're appearing online and it's really, really cheap, then we simply can't stop them ourselves. So how, how do you deal with that? Um, maybe, I don't know, do you, um, John, do you maybe want to pick up on that? Um, how do you deal with that from a supplier's uh, point of view? Well, frankly speaking, we, we don't supply um, online retailers that one won't hold stocks. I mean, taking exactly what Eric said, the number of um, online retailers that want to effectively work within what they would deem a just-in-time model. Um, they receive an order. We then have to ship it out to them as soon as possible, maybe not in the quantities which would normally um, be commercially viable. Um, and as Eric has said, they're using online purely as a hook um, without really recognising the true value of the whole model, what everyone's trying to do. I mean, Eric has brick and mortar, um, four sites, staff in each of those sites. Mm -hmm. The stock is in the shop. So we, we actually, we, we don't work with those customers um, and we do that to protect the um, specialists that we do work with. We want to make sure that they feel comfortable putting our product on our shelves and we'd much rather have the product on, on the shelves and as difficult as, the, as that has been over the last year to stick to that decision because everyone has been moving online. Um, we feel it's been the right decision because I, I believe that the relationships that we forged um, over the the whole COVID period have only strengthened as a result of that. Um, so it is a, a very much a vetting process. We have a look at every um, customer that um, inquires with us or that we're targeting to make sure that they are working within normal sort of retail brick and mortar um, margins, parameters, mm -hmm. and then um, we analyze whether we want to work with them or not, frankly speaking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and what about sort of more generally supply issues? What supply issues have you encountered this year? Um, obviously, Brexit is a huge one, and I wonder if How long have you got, Joe? How long have you got? We've um, only got 45 minutes. <laughs> um, I don't know what sort of the main, main sort of barrier you've come up against this year, and how have you worked sort of um, collaboratively to, to deal with that? Well, I think, I mean, going back to the beginning of um, March last year, I mean, we, we're we a young business, and we're... we're we were getting momentum. Um, we'd invested heavily in some new systems, um, which would um, allow us to do multi-warehouse um, stock management, um, replenishment orders from around the world, um, and indeed allow us to then reduce our minimum order quantities because everything would be done through a computer system as opposed to phone calls and emails. Mm -hmm. So that coupled with lots of new agencies, which we'd, we'd found and were bringing into the UK, it kind of stopped us in our tracks quite quickly. Um, I think like most importers, the immediate thought was, crikey, we've got a lot of stock. Um, how are we going to shift this stock and what are we going to do? And conversations that we had were, well, should we look to go direct to consumer? And we decided not to go direct to consumer um, and look to actually work more collaboratively with people such as Eric, identifying where, where are the opportunities that work for both parties. Um, that, that's been really, really good for us. I mean, I think on the supply side of things, the big challenge for us, I mean, our business, 90% is on trade, whether that's our um, London customer base, um, about 100 customers within London, then the regional wholesalers that we work with, I mean, in total, probably looking at eight to 800 to 1,000 customers um, that can, we can target our product with across the, the country. Um, the stop, start, stop, start, and then the lack of communication in certain cases, whether it be with our 
customers restaurants whether it be with our customers um that are wholesalers whether it be our customers uh, our suppliers because everyone well people have been furloughed so there's been that barrier which has sometimes prevented conversation um i'm sure you know account managers up and down the country at some point have had have been on furlough and then whether it's a retailer struggled to communicate but now the big challenge is is obviously brexit forecasting trying to understand how much stock is required mm -hmm. um the may the 17th reopenings the issue that we have is that there are still a number of uh, sommeliers general managers that are on furlough for those reopenings and the the lead time from europe um, I think the point you made at the beginning, Joe, is spot on. I mean, COVID has given us a blanket we, and no one has really, in the on-trade side of it, understood the true impact of what Brexit's going to mean. I know Daniel Lambert has done a wonderful job waving the flag and letting people know exactly what's going on and credit to him for doing that. Um, but we're looking at what was week one for week two coming out of Europe, week one for week six in certain cases. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That when you're then thinking... Okay, so we've got to hold stock. The credit terms don't change for, for us with our suppliers. It's everyone's just getting compressed. And I think the, the words that we've always wanted to, um, to use within our business throughout this whole year is communicate. Just communicate with your customers, keep talking to people and understand what, what you need to do. I mean, that's the key for, for us and for our business at the moment. Yeah, and I think communication is a key thing. Um, that that probably Ben could um, can speak very well on um, and, and getting those different parts of the supply chain to, to work together. Um, and obviously, and, and I know we'll talk to Jamie in a second because that's part of what um, Jamie and Propeller have been doing last year, which is acting as an incubator for those brands and finding a place for those niche wines coming over to the UK. But um, Ben, bef Jamie, before we come to you, Ben, can you just sort of talk about what, what yourself and Ambeva could have been doing this year and helping different parts of the supply chain talk to each other to kind of grease the wheels for some of these problems? Yeah, I guess we've, because we're a sort of a, we're not a produce supplier, a stock supplier to, to the trade. We've, we've had a slightly different view of it. I guess, you know, fortunately we're an IT company, so we could work remotely from day one. A lot of our clients weren't able to do so who were kind of on um, older versions of the system. And we've spent the last, um, 18 months moving our offering to a software as a service so you know hosted by Microsoft in the cloud um, mm -hmm. rather than being an on-premise solution um, and that actually yeah was took a lot of planning it took a lot of effort but the the difference it makes for particularly I think smaller companies now who perhaps didn't have the access to a, an IT function and you know have have an IT manager who could fire up remote access and things like that has just made that ability to be able to access your data in your in your system that much easier for those clients. Yeah. You know, we had a lot of customers who, you know, frankly were day one of struggling to get laptops out to all their clients. You know, you can do certain things on a phone um, on our on our solution. Yeah, it's not ideal, but you know, there it sort of gives you a workaround when you're trying to get hold of laptops, as is everybody else at that at that last minute. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been, you know, that's that we've seen that with a lot of our clients, and we're certainly seeing an uptick in interest in moving to, you know, a, not an on-premise version where you've got to have a have an IT function to manage backups and all the sort of boring bits of IT. Um, I, I think um, for us, a lot of it, I think, is we've seen a pivot of our customers moving to um, to online, particularly, um, and uh, some of that was. Yeah, they furloughed staff and perhaps they're seeing their customer base pivot much more to um, business to consumer. You know, we 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 supply or we have systems installed in the whole range of um, the wine trade on the sort of the pure wholesale B2B side through to B2C and fine wine. And we've seen certainly a, a big channel mix um, and a big channel change, I think, during the lockdown period. It'll be interesting to see what happens when it comes out the other side about you know, if you're supplying primarily restaurants and the on-trade, how is that going to impact your business? And how are you then going to kind of re-engineer things back to being more how it was? Um, mm. So yeah. certainly a lot of that online stuff has been interesting. Um, mm. And yeah, I think it's for, for us, a lot of it is about just, you know, actually it's if you hold the, the information in your system, you can forecast, you know, as John was saying, stock forecasting is difficult at the best of times. But, you know, if you're if you've had 12 months of, really 
reduced sales because of the impact of COVID. Well, how do you forecast what's going to be happening in May, June, July, later this year? How do you forecast what's going to happen with, you know, further down the year if, if you know, cases surge again? So, yeah. you know, it's holding that data and being able to use it and, I guess, um, be able to look at different ways of cutting it. So whether it's, okay, what if kind of scenarios, I think. Um, mm. Yeah, and as I said, you know, it seems like COVID is kind of masking a lot of those those issues, which will now see start seeing to, to bite. And I know there's been yeah. kind of reports of, of trucks and, and not being able to get their um, pallets back quick enough from the UK to Europe to be able to deal with the supply. And there may be sort of more bottlenecks coming on the horizon. So being able to talk to different supply chain um, in the the language of wine, which I know is something mm. that Bevica does, um, it calculates um, duty and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, so, Jamie, um, coming, mm. I suppose you kind of landed with the, the Brexit sort of um, the Brexit question, but I think that you know there there is that there is so much more um, cost and time involved at the moment. You know, you've got to have an EX1 form per producer per pallet at the moment to get stock over the line. How is your how is Propeller, which um, you know I've been calling it an incubator for brands coming to Indies? Um, or, or to find them a um, to find representation for them in, in the UK independency. How have you been? A how how where did that idea come from, and how have you been managing some of those um, issues with with stock, and how has that um, shaped the business model that you ended up with? Thanks. Um, well, the, the idea came about because I was doing a, a sort of a, a light version of uh, the incubator in, in the sense that I was helping producers. And matchmaking them with with wholesalers who were who were looking for the particular thing that that producer specialised in, but that obviously disappeared down the swanee overnight in in March. But but I had a lot of producers who um, both were, were clients, but also in the, in the wider network, who saw the subsequent explosion in retail and said, you know, listen, how, how can we get a how can we get a piece of the action? How can we, you know, we're, we're sitting on the sidelines at the moment. It was already difficult to get into the UK because of the nature of the, the wholesale landscape and that it's really just a matter of luck if you're talking to the right wholesale at the right time that they're looking to fill that for their portfolio. So the bottleneck just became even more pronounced. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a fairly fairly quick realisation that the, what we needed to do was to act as a, as a much more nimble um, sort of hybrid agent <laughs> to enable producers to get straight into the UK um, and benefit it, 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 to some degree from the, from the huge boom in independent retail. Um, and conversely, you know, the, the retailers were having a great time. They were having uh, and continue to. Um, and their customers, their customer base was growing and their customers were getting ever more inquiring about you know, what they're going to try next. So there was, a, there was a very ready audience for some of the you know, quirkier things that we're, we're bringing in because they are, they are not esoteric by design, but they tend to be wines that are delicious and they deliver in their own way, but that are you know, not obvious fits for um, a, a more standard wholesale portfolio. Um, so the, the partnership with EWGA uh, was, was crucial for that. That's, uh, they are a, um, a really, uh, really slick operation based up in Carnforth in, in Lancashire. Um, they have set up uh, and own outright two brilliantly run bonds, one in Lancashire, one in Gloucestershire. Um, so clearly the, the walls and the wheels bit was essential to, to the model. Uh, and they were able to provide that uh, and, and still do brilliantly um, in, a, in a way that was much more hands on than it might have been had I gone to a, a larger sort of third party provider, because the service both for the retailers and for the, our producers, our clients, um, had to be, you know, transparent and, and, and granular in detail and, and quick in terms of our response. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 kind of the the background um, and, and how it came about. Um, and in terms of Brexit, I mean, obviously it was it was not so much the elephant in the room, but you know, it was it was we knew we knew it was just around the corner. Um, so we modelled a few different scenarios in terms of how we're going to handle um, what is going to happen about documentation. You know, I mean, it wasn't until Christmas Eve that we knew we had a deal. Um, you know, as, as we all know, it's the most ridiculous semi-cliff edge scenario um, I, can, I can think of. 
Yeah. Um, but we, we'd, we'd run quite a few scenarios in terms of costs, in terms of how we consolidate and so on. <laughs> and the, the deal that, that, that the Boris and Co came up with was, was, was pretty much in line with, with one of the permutations that we, that we planned, which wasn't too expensive. Um, so we, you know, we, were, we were ostensibly ready. We've got a, with a terrific freight forwarder who we work with who, um, who acts more as a broker across, across the freight forwarding um, uh, sort of panel of providers. Um, so we can, we can work fairly bespoke solutions for, for individual producers. So, so, some of whom uh, used to be very, very happy about shipping themselves and, and it was almost a, a point of pride that, no, no, we, we've got a great guy who, who we work with locally. Um, and that's totally fine. You know, we, we, whoever can provide the best service and, and, and at the right rate, we, we're not worried about that. We just want the wine here um, safely and without getting impounded. Um, so, uh, but after Brexit, a lot of those producers are going, do you know what? Um, actually, you, you take care of it. Yeah, please, please take care of it. Um, and, uh, and, so, and so we have. So we, 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 we're looking uh, at quite a few different consolidation models mm -hmm. for, for France, Italy and Spain, slightly different structures. But um, as you know, as, as everyone knows, um, John, John and Eric, not least, the, uh, and as he was alluded, the, the X1 factor, <laughs> if you've got, let's say, a, a, couple of, a couple of mixed pallets across five different producers that have consolidated in a, in a region or, or um, consolidated a, at a central hub, you're multiplying those that documentation by five. Um, is, that, is that groupage, Jamie? Sorry, would you class that as groupage? Well, I, I, we, we talked about this the other day, didn't we? I mean, in terms of it's a, the difference between groupage and, and consolidation, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sort of, I think they're sort of they're almost interchangeable in, in some respects. I mean, it's a little bit different out of Australia, perhaps, but um, in, in terms of getting all the stock to one place so that it can be physically consolidated efficiently onto pallets is, mm. is one thing but now the the consolidation of documentation is is almost as important because nobody wants another 70 80 quid per producer on a couple of pallets because it's you know as, as daniel's outlined it, it has a disastrous effect on on the bottle price mm. uh, when it when it hits the shelf so yeah, we, we're exploring quite a few uh, a few different um, ways around the structure, partic particularly in Italy. That's the, the project that we're working on right mm -hmm. now <laughs> to enable a lot of a lot of different producers to access the UK through, via us, um, but without um, paying through the nose in terms of in terms of documentation. Mm. So, I mean, in, in summary, Bre Brexit sucks as 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 we know, as we knew, as we expected. Um, and the absence of, of clear information from government, the, the absence of a, you know, even a consistent table of the, um, for my, my language, the tariff codes, um, which, you know, from, from one market to the next um, could mean two completely different things. Uh, producers are, are equally befuddled. Um, and for producers whose specialty is making terrific wine and not dealing with red tape, um, you know, it, it is made the UK, which was already quite a tough proposition, even tougher to the point, sadly, that you know some might go, we're going to put this in the too hard box and concentrate on other markets, which is, you know, would be, would be very, very sad. Yeah, we've um, we've got a couple of questions coming in about groupage and um, and shipping from the EU, and um, you know, I think I've heard a lot that that freight forwarders are doing a lot of the heavy lifting and they're actually doing great work. Um, but obviously, it's it's the price, uh, the price of um, of you know your customs forms soon add up to something like, I think um, as we were saying, Daniel Lambert uh, earlier sort of said the cost is sort of four hundred pounds a pallet or something like that. Um, so I've got a question here from John Earl saying, how do you avoid say five um, EX one forms on a mixed pallet of five growers with ten cases each, for example? Yeah. Which you know, which, which for, from the point of view of a lot of regional wholesalers. Um, and and national wholesalers. I mean, we we we, we often bought that way for uh, for Vendum, where they were very very premium wines from you know neighbouring wineries in, in Friuli, for instance. Um, the, uh, the the problem the problem you've got is the, the multiplication of the documentation. Um, but the way around it is for the the nominal owner of the stock to be a single entity. Um, and that, that, in, that involves that nominal owner being 
for instance, one of the one of the wineries that is taking part in that shipment to agree with the other wineries that they will be, become the nominal owner and therefore be in receipt of the um, the invoice value when that's paid and then distribute that locally. Mm -hmm. Which you know, as as we found with Spain, we 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 tried one structure to do this, but the the, the Spanish tax laws. Um, are, are even more intense than, than the Italian ones and the, the producers were, were faced with um, the prospect of some very inquisitive um, tax inquiries mm. because move, moving money between themselves um, without any uh, sort of clear product movement was, was you know, inevitably treated quite suspiciously. But yeah, in, in answer to your question, John, I mean, that, that's, <clears throat> that's, that's how to um, achieve it to, to crystallize that those five produces into effectively one mm -hmm. and therefore one, one document mm -hmm. so um yeah i think because um you know in terms of just throwing it back back open a bit wider then to how we um actually sorry do you know what? i think maybe sorry i've just got a couple more questions coming in mm. but i think maybe the question we also need to ask is how, how do we overcome that then in terms of collaboration how how can we as the uk maintain um, this market as an attractive market um, for uh, producers and exporters worldwide and how can we actually how can we collaborate here as well to make that a smoother process because obviously we've got a problem of, of producers saying well I don't want to be um, you know responsible for those EX1 forms you voted for Brexit why should I be paying for that so if you're making is that is that right Jamie when you're saying about making the producers the owners so with that where would the cost fall to the for say EX1 forms well I mean the, the cost yeah, I mean, five five ex one forms becoming one ex one form is is quite a quite an attractive equation for five producers looking to to get their wine to the UK. Yeah, um, yeah. But you know, but there 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 is a cost that's that's not the equal of five ex ones, where it needs to be administrated um, properly in terms of in terms of their their local tax audits uh, and and how they're reporting any transfer of money that that you know inevitably has to happen once. The invoice for that total shipment um, is paid yeah um, and for us that's even more complicated because <clears throat> the producers we work with um, it, it's on a consignment and retainer basis um, and we're distributing the wholesale margin that we earn for those producers back to them yeah, yeah. So, you know that, that 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 movement of cash back is is much more fragmented than it might be for just settling one invoice yeah, I'm um, sorry. I think Ed, Eric, you were nodding there. Did you want to um to add anything? Yeah, what I was going to add is that I think what's going to happen is, is there's going to be a bit of a shift in in various businesses. If you want to operate to to do to work like Groupage, I found a few guys who are already operating like that in France. So they've got a holding company. They represent say 15 different merchants. They've got one. Uh, they've got one um, central warehouse, and it can all be picked up from one place. And I think. You'll see a rise of that as a, as a service being offered in, in regions of obviously France and Italy and Spain, I reckon. Um, but also, unfortunately, this also plays very much into, into the hands of the big guys. You know, the, the, the larger people can ship and, and, you know, make it much more affordable. So we will be dominated, I fear, by, you know, larger agents, you know, the, the big guys like Solomon Matthew Parks and um, Bebendums and, and people like that. And, I think the pressure is for us smaller independents and we actually can still go buy and be effective so i mean one i think one of the pleasures that we all actually get from this trade and it's been over a year now since the last one i went to but i went to the uh, wine paris exhibition which is brilliant but the problem with that now is that if i for me to justify shipping from there is going to be really really difficult to actually get that kind of um the right amount from the right producers and that I think sort of like makes it a bit more tricky and it's an easier, much easier process for us to buy from UK sources if that's the route we want to go down. Mm -hmm. I, I, no, I don't think any of us did this for an easy job anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. Just to throw in a cur curveball of, um, of COVID and Brexit at the same time, um, John, how, what, are you, what are your thoughts on, on all this and how, how are you kind of dealing with these headwinds? Oh, John, so I think we might have to come off mute. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, dealing with it with lots of headaches. I mean, I think we, um, w our business model is in talking collaboration. We do so equally with our producers. So we try and 
only offer one producer for each region, each sort of designation appellation. Um, I mean, we we are firmly of the belief when working with our producers that let's say a company from Puglia, um, we only need one company from Puglia. If they're then committed to us, we're committed to them. I think the economy is a scale that that we've reached at a company. I mean, now it allows us to be ordering two, four, six pallets from each each producer. Um, I think wind the clock back to when we started, this would have been a nightmare for us, frankly. Um, I mean, I think the the EX the EX one forms are obviously a cost. There are other costs as well. Um, Eric is. 100% right that this plays into the hands of, um, you know, the really larger companies who can amortize their costs across shipments. So it's maybe even only a penny a bottle per se, as opposed to whether it's 30p, 40p, 50p um, increase that's coming through. Um, I mean, we've we found that we are at that point where we can do container consolidations, two, three pallets from each producer from Northeast or Northwest Italy. Um, so the, the real problem for us, yes, there is a cost. Um, yes, we are trying to amortize and, and work with our producers as much as possible, not to pass that cost on to, to our customer base. Um, frankly, we have to pass some cost on. Um, but I think it's, it's a case of, as I said before, I mean, for us, the key here is working closely with our customers. If we all know what we want and the customer, understands that there are these additional delays there are you know going to be issues with stock holding as long as we we are talking we have an understanding of what say two three four months of sales is from one of our producers we can then increase the size of the order and it makes life much easier but uh, of course life isn't that simple do you think um, one for everyone do you think that, that the past year has um created great a greater conversation and greater communication between different parts of the supply chain or do you think um because it's been so stressful and challenging that there's been breakdowns of communication so who, who ever wants to there's certainly been lots of communication but it's been pretty um effective communication pretty frank, pretty frank picture for the most part <clears throat> it's like where, where the hell's my wine um, yeah. but yeah i mean i, I think as, as as eric mentioned you know, this, the structures that will inevitably um, get put in place formally in, in around the EU um, will be will be very welcome, and of course, you know that's that's going to be motivated commercially. People can see an opportunity, and you know it will be a chargeable service, but but hopefully um, a charge that uh, you know is not disproportionate to to what it might have been otherwise or, or, or before. <clears throat> um, and I think you know how how we looking back to how, how retailers have embraced. The, the online um, surge, the relationship with couriers, the understanding about how couriers work, the realities of, of, of packaging, the cost of packaging. I mean, it's, it's been, you know, incredibly educational, mm -hmm. not necessarily in the most pleasant way, but, you know, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a baptism of fire, which, which I think everyone is str stronger and more resilient as a result of. Mm. Um, so you know, it, it can only be positive. You know, we've 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 been we've been very we've been very British about it, I think, and and just yeah. got on with it and learnt mm. uh, learnt as we went get, went along. Um, ben, actually, I wonder because you obviously work with different all different types of companies. How what have you seen in terms of sort of the supply chain working close together? Have you seen effective um, types of communication? Has has the past year um, created? conversations around how different parts of the supply chain can work together better i guess we have i mean we we have a bevica user group so that's users of our system the last one that we had was a week before lockdown kicked in so i guess you know that's where we would see the collaboration and it's a chance for you know users of our system um and potential users as well to sort of get together and have a have a discussion about these kind of things it, obviously there is a technology slant to it um we don't see this kind of, you know, external parties, whether it's, you know, a bonded warehouse or a freight forwarder involved in that, but, you know, they're more than welcome to, to come along and uh, sort of join the conversation. And we've had external talkers for that. So I don't think we've seen it uh, probably in terms of the, the way that other people would see it because we're not, you know, we're not a, we're not a, a, 
a, a seller of wine so we're not speaking to other sellers of wines on that kind of level um, I think we you know we're seeing more more requests for things like sending structured data to a third party whether it's your bonded warehouse or a freight forwarder because I guess it then streamlines them having to repeat into that system and that, that data into their system um, mm -hmm. so that's kind of what we're seeing more and more and yeah we've seen an awful lot of teams and zoom meetings as well um, yeah absolutely We've, um, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in. So I wonder if I could maybe ask my sort of one big other theme um, and then we can go back to some of those questions. But I think one of the big things I've just in the, on, the, on the topic of collaboration, what would you like to see um, over the next year? What types of collaboration and what, how would you like to work better with, with um, a, maybe a particular part of the supply chain and one that you're sort of hoping to will evolve positively over the next year? Where would you like to see the change happen? Um, John, don't know if you want to, any particular that jumps up for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, a slightly guarded answer, but equally an important one. I mean, I think there is an, an increasing onus on importers to be responsive, to be flexible, to provide the best pricing, all of these different things, which I think it's our, it's our obligation to do all of that. I think um, making sure that we're we're all understanding what each other are trying to get out of a trade relationship is really important. Um, I think for for us as a business, I mean, whether that's from a producer side or equally from a customer side, and and making plans to not only execute that, but then actually maximise the profitability around those core areas which each of us are looking to achieve. Um, I think we're, we're really fortunate that we've got an absolutely wonderful freight forwarder um, that we work with um, and they are incredibly supportive. Our bond that we work with are incredibly supportive and we have our own fleet distribution. So in terms of the collaboration side, for us, it's very much with our customer base to make sure that we're all adding value. Um, and it's and it's a two way, two way street. Yeah, yeah, it makes complete sense. Eric? Did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the things that we've already had a conversation with quite a few, you know, friends in the, in the trade who work as agents, and, and it's a concept of what I call piggybacking. So essentially, I'll have a chat with them about what they're going to be shipping stuff over, and we can both help each other out. Because if they say, right, I'm shipping over from X, do you want some? I said, you know what, that'd be quite good. I'll take 20 cases of that. And if they have that conversation with maybe three or four other people, We'll say 20 cases, then bang, that's two pallets. Okay, and then they're suddenly reducing those costs. So it means they get their wines in um, at a better price too. And obviously we'll be buying at a better price as well. And I think things like that, those sort of conversations um, are really worthwhile having. The other thing I think that we also need to be more collaborative is not just in our own small industry as well, but the, the sort of the towns that we, we you know, especially for us retailers mm. that we work with as well. And I think that's very, very important at the moment because you know, I'm, I'm, I know that we're, we've been incredibly lucky in wine retail, um, especially as Surrey has tried to sort of like drink its way through a pandemic. Um, I know that a lot of other shops and everything else have really struggled hard. And I think it's very important that we sort of like to miss as much of the high street as possible and whichever way we can do that. Yeah, I think I remember you saying, Eric, that the, um, you know, it's been very lonely on the high street this year, you look up and down, it's just kind of empty, empty shop windows. And I know it, before all this, there was, you know, a lot of a lot of kind of collaboration going on in terms of partnering with other retail businesses, you know, whether that's for, for I don't know, out, outdoor garden wear or um, picnicking or local um, catering, things like that. Um, but just to go back to what you were saying earlier um, about, um, you know, buy piggybacking, how does that differ to say a buying group like Independence, which I know obviously you're um, well, with, 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 with the independence, it's, it's brilliant. It's, it's really well organised. Um, we got some fantastic um, agencies, and that works really, really well. Piggybacking, however, works in a different way. So, for example, you know, like my mate who supplies restaurants up in town, uh, he's he's a one man band, but he'll say to me, "Look, Eric, I'm you know shipping in from this one producer in Loire. I know you like their wines. I only need probably because he can't really justify what you know what level of demand he's going to get." We can split a pallet maybe happy days it's good for him good for me so rather than so you know and it's just that collaboration having those conversations and i think that's you know that's the advantage i've been in the trade for some time so you know quite a few people in that situation where we can all now help each other out a little bit mm -hmm. and you know he's got some amazing guys he works with as well too so 
I think there's, there's some real benefits uh, from that. And um, yeah, I think it's just having, you know, good conversations with people. And it's nice to catch up with some guys who might not speak for some time as well and say, look, what can we do to help? What can we do to work together and be collaborative? Yeah, um, we just think John and Earl um, on the chat did earlier say, you know, that that's a good idea in principle, but sadly a lot of the small farmer growers don't have time to, to deal with that. But I suppose that comes in to the whole idea of collaboration and, 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 and working closer to be able to facilitate those things. Yeah, for, for, for the, the one, one thing I'd say is, is yes, keep the, the paperwork simple. So I put my hand up and say, look, I'll do that deal and ship that in and I'll pay that. And then you do this one and, you, and we'll pay that one. And as long as you know we all trust each other that we're going to do that, yeah, and, and, and you build people you know well, then then that's, that that works really well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think we we have an our same question to Jamie and Ben about where would you like to see a change happen? People be more open to to working as as Eric was saying, you know, quid pro quo almost, and um, having that flexibility to be able to um, meet halfway on supply issues. Mm. Well, I, I think I mean as Eric. Uh, mentioned the piggybacking um, is is a lovely way of buying wine and and frankly is more necessary now than ever because consolidating the the demand <clears throat> and consolidating the the costs and the admin um, are you know super super important now because it's it's a significant change um, post Brexit uh, as to what as to what that um, the, the issues that poses a retailer um, and you know the I think from a retail point of view, you know, of course, buying wine from UK agents is 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 part of the mix, and and that's that's great. And there are some fantastic, you know, awesome wines, which you know belong to be on on everyone's shelves. But there is there is much greater pride um, in knowing that you really have shipped that wine yourself, and you can speak sincerely to your customers, saying this is our terrain sauvignon, effectively. Mm. Uh, we've been there we've been following these guys for the last 10 years and you know here's here's the here's the 2020 um and if if they've um achieved that or, or made it even easier post brexit by shipping with some two or three other um colleagues elsewhere in the uk so there's a feeling of regional exclusivity that's you know that's a perfect perfect scenario um and for, you know for our part we want to um, support that, and you know, we provide that service in, in a you know in a in a roundabout way in terms of helping the producers to consolidate and, and get them here so that um, retailers can can access them uh, yeah. in a way that suits them. Yeah. Um, and I, I think for, from a from a, a government point of view, um, if if collaboration is the right word, or at least maybe openness and um, consistency at least. Um, is that you know the the digital um, solutions that that could be brought to bear on so many of these headaches are you know well established in in other industries in in, in other areas not necessarily mm -hmm. from an importation point of view but there is the wherewithal and the, the technology to easily smooth out um, smooth this out um, <laughs> which which seems like a you know a bit of a sort of commercial vandalism really that we're, that we're not making it easier for for importers to to interact with our you know our friends in the eu but you know that's that might be wishful thinking or it might be around the corner who, who knows we've um clearly this is all hitting a call because we've got some questions coming in so let me um quickly and um, just run through those if that's all right so ali's been very patient um so ali is asking about the issue of insurance um we we're talking about consolidating wine offers um, and you know, not a nominal nominal ownership um, from different producers. What about insurance and liability with that? Where does the liability fall if that's the method we're going to going to use? Well, if 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 a single producer is going to take responsibility, so the nominal responsibility for the shipment, then they have to do so with with insurance as well. Um, but individually. Um, locally sorting out the respective contributions that, that everyone's played a part uh, in, in bringing that shipment together. But, you know, th there will be, <clears throat> as Eric's, you know, highlighted, there will be providers who do this in a much more rounded way, a, a much less ad hoc process. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that will be part and parcel of that, of that process. Yeah, yeah, it's just, um, it's another, another cost, isn't it, to, to factor in. Mm. Um, we've got another question for, um, uh, from Nish Kotecha here, um, talking about piggybacking and um, 
might be it's a method that um that they're considering going forwards um i think it's more of a comment really nish wasn't it just saying about piggybacking is um is a method that's that's probably going to work well um and then we've got another question here from william about um should we be expecting more information and collaboration from freight forwarders um i know we've heard a lot about um freight, freight forwarders some doing a great job and really um taking a lot of the the customs um heavy lifting um off importers hands um also some sort of uh, reports about price gouging and the issue of actually um getting pallets back and forth from the uk and um having the availability of of, of trucks and people and customs agents to process that um is very thin it's going to be thin on the ground and maybe causing delays so do we think we should be expect? do you think that the trade and businesses should be expecting more collaboration information from freight forwarders John, don't know if you want to pick up on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think freight forwarders at the moment, they're, I mean, under this sort of blanket that we've all been living um, under, I mean, obviously, uh, Eric hasn't necessarily been as much as, say, we have supplying the on trade, but um, they've been doing a sterling job um, without really sort of being able to explain in, in all the detail all of the issues that they've got. Um, at the moment going through i mean you're right i mean take the even the clerks for clearing um clearing um orders when I mean, there's going to be an additional 200 million this year and we haven't got the clerks to do it um i mean there's huge huge pressure i mean the freight forwarder we work with they were a team of four people two years ago they're now 29 people they've got people working um there seven days a week 12 hours a day i mean i think um, getting information from them at times at the moment is difficult because they are just so busy trying to get the shipments through mm -hmm. and trying to deal with all the mess that has been created as a result of Brexit. I mean, even one kilo deviation from um, the different paperwork, then it's held at port and it can't get through. I mean, th these are things which, are, when you consider a container, I mean, to be one kilo out, I mean, it could even be something that's been picked up whilst the, the containers move through into modal, um, has now got pressure as well. Um, I mean, there are going to be increased costs. I think freight forwarders are going to have to pass on some costs, which they're going to be incurring at the moment because of the difficulty getting um, containers back into Europe. Um, and I think we as an industry, and more importantly, consumers, are going to have to realise that the goalposts have changed on price points. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are going to change. And there's we need to... Um, sort of start selling up the ladder as opposed to constantly looking to sell down the ladder, which I think is, um, you know, key. But the freight forwarders, I think fundamentally it will arrive at a point where it, you won't be picking over pennies. You'll be actually asking, can you do the job? I mean, that's frankly where I see with everything going on at the moment and different things that I've heard about large retailers struggling to get containers, hundreds of containers into the market. I mean, this, this is a very real problem. Um, so I think there's the idea of COVID and growing tolerance and patience. I think never more so do we need to be tolerant and patient with the freight forwarders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, ben, just to sort of throw it open to you as well, because obviously Part of this is about keeping that communication going with different parts of the um, the supply chain. Do you so do, within Bevica? Do you do you talk to 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 the freight side of things, or is it more in the UK? No, I mean it, technically it could do if they have the the capability to ingest something in a kind of a, in a structured format. But I think it's you know alluding to what Jamie said. It's you need someone to centralise this kind of requirement of data. At which point everybody can work to the same the same format. Um, and I think, yes, in other industries, that's all been done, but I think a lot of these things aren't. And, you know, I think to an extent, the government would have to be the people to lead some of that because, you know, it's quite a dispersed industry. Um, I think, you know, from our side, seeing the sort of that collaboration, I guess, OK, yes, you can share documentation a lot easier. But I think it's for us is if you can remove some of the admin burden, whether it's giving you better cost visibility in your system or accuracy, or just being able to know where your order is at because you're tracking the status on it in the system, it gives you a bit more headroom to be able to pick up the phone and speak to a producer rather than worrying about just, you know, doing the kind of not make work, but the kind of the, 
the administration that's just trying to keeping you above water. Um, so that's that. And I think from our side as well, you know, we're we're we've always have been responsive, but it's just trying to listen to our clients and customers and understand what the requirement might be across the industry. And then we've got a a solution which, you know, when people use our product, they have that. Mm. And you were also saying earlier about um, the capability within the system of calculating, um, you know, um, if, if you've got stock, will you pay, pay up front and then the stock maybe if you're delayed before you're going to get the stock, it'll help you cal calculate those complexities. Yeah, so, you know, whether it's just adding on additional charges, so, you know, customs is now going to cost us £80, so we need to add that onto the landed cost. Mm. What's the impact of that? You know, what margin am I actually making? So, you know, actually, as long as you track it, if it's tracked in the system, you're not kind of having to do a an offline calculation and then wondering why your cash flow isn't looking as good as you expected it to. Um, yeah. So it's those capabilities, which I think, and just the sort of, you know, if I prepay and get a 5% discount, what difference might that make to me? Um, and having a system, a, a system based way to do those things rather than, a, you know, an offline, I'll stick it in an Excel spreadsheet or get my calculator out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we're almost out of time there. So we have covered so much and we've, we've, we've sort of skimmed a lot of things that are, are you know, obviously very important. So um, if anybody has any follow up questions, I'm sorry, I've tried, endeavoured to answer as many as possible. Um, but if you do want to ask any follow up questions, email them to me um, and I'll try and, and try and get them answered for you. Um, but, you know, it, there's a huge amount of complexity there. And I think the real sort of takeaway is that enabling and um, creating that kind of bandwidth to be able to, 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 to be nimble and to be flexible and to be able to bring stock in in perhaps slightly different ways than we have before. Um, but really interesting what you were saying about, um, you know, piggybacking and those different ways of, of bringing in stock. Um, is there any kind of final comments that anybody would like to make before we, before we wrap up? Uh, the, the, just one, and, and I think there is one, there is one positive I'm taking from uh, Brexit. And that is that uh, all of those guys in Europe who sell their wine to the UK without tax uh, can't get their goods in. So that's that's kind of like that's that's a positive in my One mind. Silver lining, yeah. mentioning, mentioning no names, but yeah, mentioning no names. Quite right. Any other silver linings? One one sort of one off silver linings. Um, from 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 the because you know this past year has, has created a huge amount of change so maybe not from brexit but what's right. sort of the one positive that you're sort of taking forward this year from from the um you know channel innovation and um, upheaval for, for me it's virtual tasting absolute mm. winner and i think that's going to keep going yeah I think it's yeah. the way it's the way you, all the way always the way you define it, is it? On the one hand, it's upheaval. On the other hand, it's innovation and change. It's sort of a, a glass half full situation. Depends how you look at it. But chat, yeah. but virtual tastings, absolutely. Yeah, I mean Zoom, Zoom in general. <clears throat> I mean the, the number of meetings I've been able to do. Um, some, sometimes we're all actually wearing trousers as well, which is quite original. Um, with producers over the last sort of six six to nine months, um, and get decisions made quickly. Uh, wine shipped more or less quite quickly um, and, and deals done, which which in normal times would have taken yonks to, oh, we'll see it at Crowbar and we'll see it in Italy, um, which is great, but, you know, it, the pace would be glacial by comparison. Mm -hmm. And can I add little bottles of wine? I'm seeing a lot of little bottles of wine everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, everybody, we're at half past, so we're going to say thank you to everybody and um, thank you to all for listening. We've, we have recorded this as well, so um, tell your friends and colleagues if they've missed it, they can catch up on Harper's. Um, and, um, and sorry, one, one last question from William. How, how big are the, how little are the little volumes, Eric? Uh, so we use 185, so we literally pour them, re pour them by hand and then curry them out to our customers. So it's a perfect size for two people to share. Uh, but trying to get hold of these little bottles is difficult because they're made in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Everybody, everybody go out and find your small bottles. <laughs> right. Thanks so much, everybody. And um, we'll um, catch up with you all hopefully very soon. Mm -hmm.